The lesson I got from replaying Deus Ex is that something that can seem unpolished and horribly aged on the surface can hide a charming and absorbing interior. Looking at Deus Ex can give off the wrong impression now, but after the first few hours I found it to be sucking the life out of me. In a positive way, I mean. I understand why it's considered one of, if not the best game of all time. It's expansive without being padded, it's well balanced in terms of progression, it's written in a way that continuously draws your interest, but most of all it's both ambitious and successful in its execution. Mostly. It deserves its praise, but it also brings in a negative point that can't be anticipated by the developers or reviewers and that is the game's impact on potential sequels. Having the first entry of the franchise be such a success will put pressure on the developers and place its expectations in the audience's head. It was a large part of the reason why Invisible War is considered the worst of the franchise as far as main installments go. Soon after that game's release, Iron Stung would shut down, Warren Spector would make Disney games, Eidos would be bought by Square Enix, and the rights to the Cyberpunk franchise would be given to a new studio in Montreal. There's a console generation gap between Invisible War and Human Revolution, which is an eternity as technological advancement goes, and as such a lot of things have changed. Standards rose in the audience, technology improved in every creative field, budgets have inflated, and the number of games released per year had increased, thanks to new distribution platforms becoming more common. Despite these new concerns, which meant that games needed to appeal more to the mass market to make back its budget, it's surprising that Human Revolution still holds up on its own, despite elements trying to drag it down. Deus Ex Human Revolution had a lot of objectives to complete, since the franchise is now in a new gaming landscape that has forced the AAA sector to make the game for as many people as possible. It has to stand on its own while also living up to the legendary reputation that the original had built up. Franchises have done this, both past and present, with mixed success, and in a way it's easy to see at first glance why some of these new entries weren't successful. Syndicate tried to bring back the tactical franchise onto modern hardware by making it a first person shooter, which didn't click on despite it utilising some very interesting visuals. While Syndicate was a respected game, it didn't have the critically lauded status that Deus Ex had, being championed as one of the best games of all time, and as such completely changing the genre wouldn't generate positive buzz, and as you can see, it didn't. Tomb Raider on the other hand kept the tone and the sense of surreal nature, and it launched a new series that has changed one of the most iconic characters into a different person in many ways. It was successful in the sense that Square Enix backed a second one, and it's easy to believe that they will give a new or pre-existing studio both in and out of their corporate library another shot with another IP Square Enix own, thanks to Deus Ex and Tomb Raider. You can't change too much and you can't change too little. You're making a new game for a new audience that just so happens to share a name with an iconic game. Do it right and people will respect and even love it as we have seen in Doom, but do it wrong then the negative aspects will only be highlighted more, and the references to the previous entries will be dismissed as pandering. So how do you make such a game? You soft reboot it. By using Deus Ex's cliff notes, the developers were able to insert story and gameplay elements that have now become the standard in a lot of recent releases. Rebooting a franchise for the modern age means it needs to simplify it due to the aforementioned budget inflation. That's why the cover-based system is there, to insert what has become recognisable to the common audience within the game. It's why the RPG elements have been simplified, no longer affecting your combat ability, instead unlocking tools and opportunities for the player. Melee combat was reworked to be more flashy, which isn't a complete negative since melee combat in the original game wasn't stellar. Shooting is much easier to handle, so you no longer have to wait 5 seconds to be accurate when you start, which personally works thematically with our main character, and the boss fights are easy to highlight in terms of pacing, which is an issue I'll get into later. The game needed to be welcoming to newcomers, which will irate some older fans, since it was one of the reasons why Invisible War is considered a non-game alongside the rushed development, but it manages to be welcoming in a way that isn't too distracting from the main plot, 
Ever wonder why the beginning starts with cutscenes walking and encourages shooting by giving you an assault rifle immediately? This is why. It's not only used as a narrative tool, but it's also used to lull the player into a comfortable mindset. It's not giving you augmentations, and the only alternative method of fighting is just sneaking around, which is encouraged, but for the average player it's a strange cross between Call of Duty and Gears of War. So no matter what demographic it aims for with its marketing, it will be familiar territory for both camps. But then it stops you in your tracks and completely destroys that progress, before injecting you into some of the main elements of the series, including exploration, stealth, and augmentations. I like the fact that the game forces you to stop and smell the roses, and demands that you find information in the same way that an obsessive completionist would. It turns into a Deus Ex game at this point, since it encourages you to find some information through NPCs, and establishes recognisable characters whom blur the line between contempt and respectable, making you question their real allegiance. In fact, during that piece of quiet time there is a silent clock in the background that can lead to consequences, which was something that the developers were adamant to include when they realised that a hostage crisis elsewhere needs to end in one way or another. And I was playing, I was reviewing the build in uh, November 2010, and we were almost better and everything. And I realized, oh my god, like, it's just smoke and mirror, and we don't yeah. carry it through. We're, we're totally fucked, basically. Uh, we, we need to, to have a real consequence yeah. to to that thing. And uh, and I uh, said, we need to re-record lines with... And we basically need to kill the hostages and we need we don't to kill get the there hostages, in time. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then it and was the was, quest for... Yeah, and what was crazy about it was, first of all, we were so close to like almost having to ship the game that we'd released a lot of our actors. We'd already mm. done all the recording. And Seraph himself... So we had to go through and we had to kind of indicate which which actors would have to be brought back, how many lines they'd have, and then we had to kind of get, we had to find Steve Shellen. Yeah, we found him somewhere on a, <laughs> <laughs> somewhere on a beach yeah. in Morocco doing something. He was on vacation. Someone, he was right? on vacation. Yeah, he was uh, He'd he been was wrapped. there. Yeah, well, he was done. Yeah, yeah. And we it, was it was just a few days before the deadline, and Steve came to me, he's like, well, hopefully it's going to work and the qu the, 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 the quality, sound, quality, the quality yeah. is going to be there. Otherwise, we might not be able to use it and we were super stressed. Well, it was a fun ride. Tools of stealth are then made available and the tutorials encourage hacking and sneaking. Even the bonus objectives outright encourage alternative methods of approach. And the first boss fight approach is decided by the player. The template is there, and the designers obviously know what makes Deus Ex fun, but also recognises the flaws and horribly aged conventions that wouldn't be accepted today. I had huge problems with the previous game that boiled down to some questionable design decisions, and the fact that the visuals have aged horribly. Take the city for example. In Deus Ex it had buildings plopped into a sandbox that were mostly barren of civilians, and didn't make sense in terms of modern architecture. In Human Revolution, the density of people and objects have increased to at least make the setting feel like an urban setting. Buildings are actually plausible in structure, thanks to some creative use of backdrops and backstory. Personally, I always found it strange that a hotel in the middle of Hell's Kitchen was only a few stories high, despite it being set in the future in one of the highest population densities in the world. While Seraph Industries can be more believable as a skyscraper, despite it only having four open and small explorable floors, thanks to a clever elevator trick. Humans animates like humans, the AI has improved while still sticking to some of the basic actions the original Deus Ex had, and the level design still allows you to choose from a mixture of combat and augmented abilities, or stealth and utilities both in and outside the player's control. Swimming is now gone and stealth tools have been reworked to be both worth using while being accessible. In fact, it's kind of funny that the Tranquilizer of the past is more silent and powerful against the enemy than the same thing in the future. At the end of the day, it needs to be a Deus Ex game, otherwise it will be less commercially viable. It may have enough elements to be its own game, but it still needs to have recognisable aspects of Deus Ex, otherwise it might go down the same path as DMC Devil May Cry, with the familiar elements being there but barely recognisable as an entry of the franchise despite it being a reboot of sorts. Human Revolution, unlike DMC, isn't afraid to dive right into the pre-established history and expand upon it. 
DMC essentially used its established universe as a simple starting point, changing the look, the tone and characters from traits to entire backstories, when it isn't just reimagining the character from the ground up to begin with. The result was a jarring shift in a game I found unpleasant overall. While Deus Ex Human Revolution is a soft reboot in relation to catching a new audience, all it did was rewind the clock and filled in the gaps. While the story can be experienced within a vacuum, a returning fan can point out the little pieces Idus Montreal inserted to keep the universe consistent. When I first played this, I didn't know who this man was or why Versalife made Neuroprazine expensive, but after playing Deus Ex, it made a little more sense. Its approach to story reminds me of Metal Gear Solid 3, in a sense that it takes place in the past but is largely disconnected from the rest of the series, minus the fact that the main character is called Snake. I'm a huge fan of this approach to rebooting the franchise, since it doesn't beg the audience to discard what you have learned in the previous games. In fact, it can be more rewarding to returning customers if done right. If successful, you can insert your own ideas and messages without it being too jarring. It's probably why I found Final Fantasy weird in terms of its core concept, since new customers may feel like they need to go through nearly 30 years of lore, and returning customers are not rewarded for the amount of time they have put into the other entries. It's cool that Deus Ex manages to avoid this quarter century shift by keeping the reality more plausible, while injecting enough ideas in to present that familiar and attractive cyberpunk tone. In fact, I'd say this game is pre-cyberpunk at its core, since everything feels very human. You're in a world where humans are still living mundane lives and stick to down-to-earth occupations, but everything from the buildings to the orange tint and the music present the reality that the entire world and those who run it is slowly leaving those people behind. And looking at the original entry, that's exactly what happens. It's that uncanny tone that makes this game one of my favourite games of all time, and the perfect example of why I love cyberpunk. Taking a look at Adam Jensen as a core character and as a representation of the genre show why it's personally fascinating. The augmentations he is implanted with are sleek and really rad, but the consequences that come with it, including being more susceptible to poverty as well as becoming an easier target for those who would use you to their advantage, would make anyone shy away from making that decision. But despite how much I enjoy the game, it isn't perfect, and it shows off some of the bigger weaknesses of rebooting a franchise for the modern day. It's clear that Square was very nervous about their investment, since it is a game that is also the first product to come out of their Montreal studio, and some of the most glaring telltale signs come from the technology. Despite everyone now moving like humans, you can tell Eidos didn't put much priority into their animation department. Lip syncing isn't great, but the body animations are the ones that stand out to me. For often than not, you will see Adam cross his arms while whoever he talks to nods and tilt their head to the right frequently. It's immersion breaking, and it's an issue I hope gets fixed in Mankind Divided. All of that can be attributed to the development team rushing to meet deadlines fairly easily, and evidence of that can be seen in the augment screen. How can you put in a supposed upgrade that literally does nothing? Did no one pick this up in testing? It's absurd that even after a delay, that the feature was still included. The biggest flaw, however, is when outsourced portions of the game are given to people who didn't know what they were making. Now, I'm not against outsourcing at its core, since it takes stress off the developers, which I'm all for considering the state the industry is in. And Michael McCann has done a wonderful job with the soundtrack. I am, however, against outsourcing when it doesn't diegetically fit into the gameplay. I hate the boss fights, and I'm pretty sure everyone else, including the developers, does too. I understand that giving a section of the game to someone else can alleviate stress, the gaming industry has enough of that, but when it grinds against the openness and core themes of the rest of the game, that's when I start to have a problem. For the record, I originally played the game with a release copy and replayed it with the director's cut, and neither version was great. I appreciate what Eidos tried to do when they decided to fix core criticisms of Human Revolution, but there was a missed opportunity with these encounters. They should be climatic in the sense that we overcame something, not just in a visual spectacle sense. 
Grip Entertainment didn't either do their research or information wasn't communicated properly between the core team and Grip, and as a result we got a stain in an otherwise stellar game. I have accepted that we're going to be living with this kind of mindset from now on, with budgets going up and the demand for games increasing, alongside a far more crowded market, you're going to need to cut corners in certain areas in order to meet the crucial deadline. It's a state I hate, but in a way it means that the truly great AAA games that come out nowadays deserve even more credit. Like the original Deus Ex, there are many flaws with the game that can and cannot be ignored. But like the original game, the complete package makes for an absorbing game. If Deus Ex is supposed to represent ambitious projects come the turn of the millennium, then Human Revolution represents how to successfully make a soft reboot for modern systems. What remains now is how Mankind Divided learns the lessons of Human Revolution, while also contributing to the legacy of Deus Ex.